Good evening, I'm L.A. Steele. Tonight I'm going to do a great, great essay from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's entitled Compensation. Through my life and studies, few figures or writers in history have made such an impression on me that I can refer to their writing and wisdom time and again and see a new, fresh, and full understanding of a man's self and by doing so, hear a universal language that reaches to the soul of another individual. This is the ultimate goal of any con communicator, either a poet, writer, musician, or artist, or orator. To have the remarkable genius to equate the laws of man with the laws of nature, and the laws of spirituality, and the coining of a phrase and concept called the oversoul. If I could involve my listening and viewing audience into a philosophical, meaningful discussion, then I would by all means have successfully accomplished a very difficult task. Tonight I am beginning a reading on the, essays of, well, of, on the essay of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in his lifetime and a full century later has inspired every generation and continues to do so. The depth of his theological observations are so clear as any stated in the Bible. His philosophy is purely based on his knowledge and faith and a wonderful pragmatism that makes his work unshakable and stunning to the human psyche. I was tempted to edit his work for time's sake and the demands of a 30-minute program, but because this program is access television and free of commercial restraints, I will indulge in a complete reading of several of his greatest essays. Since those of you who are watching tonight perhaps have been following my show, I feel it is a, my duty to provide you with insights into a greater understanding of my work and the works of those who inspired me. I hope I don't lose viewers for this, but I am certain that if I read his works truly to you, you will find Mr. Emerson to be most interesting and compelling. And I hope that I might accomplish a very worthy goal, and that would be to enlighten my viewers and expand their minds. Tonight is a true test of integrity on my part and friendship on yours. It takes a great commitment from both narrator and audience to establish the need for a program like mine. As a viewer of television for my entire life, I believe that viewers fall into two categories. The first is the most gullible and sensually vulnerable and escapist. The second is the less vulnerable, the more intelligent, the most curious, or the most keenly aware. I am both at times and love to escape into a great movie or book or song. But those that attract me in this way do so by their intelligence, their sensitivity, and beauty. There are, these are the ingredients to great television, to great writing, to great theater. I am at a certain disadvantage with regards to slick presentation and professional broadcast technicians, but as Emerson would believe, from a medium's simplicity is where its power is derived, the rawness, the lightning and great thunder. Here is a writer with his pen, being viewed without phoniness or pretense, without hype or glibness, but making an honest attempt to communicate his ideas with someone else. Anyone who attempts to communicate with the general public holds himself up to a degree of scrutiny, scorn, and contempt, but those who may those who may not understand by those who may not understand him. I am no different, but I do believe that my message is different. I feel that what I believe and have learned may help others rather than hinder them. In this strange and unknown land is where I work and live. Here on each program once a week, I welcome you to join me. Viewer loyalty is a great gift, one not to be belittled or abused. It is a living, breathing life force linked to a concept or an individual that can take on mammoth proportions and consequences. I may shock you or bore you or interest you, 
but I will try not to offend you. If you are still watching my program, I am deeply overwhelmed by your interest, and for that one viewer or several who have enjoyed my last broadcast, I hope to be able to provide you with many more. And for those new viewers, I welcome you to my world. I will now begin my reading of Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on compensation, written over 150 years ago and is as relevant today as it was then. <coughs> Ever since I was a boy, I have wished to write a discourse on compensation, for it seems to me, when very young, that on this subject life was ahead of theology, and the people knew more than the preacher taught. The documents, too, from the doctrine is to be drawn, charm my fancy by their endless variety, and lay always before me, even in sleep. For they are the tools in our hands, the bread in our basket, the transactions of the street, the farm and the dwelling house, the greetings, the relations, the depths and credits, the influence of character, the nature and endowment of all men. It seemed to me also that in it might be shown men a ray of divinity, the present action of the soul of this world, clean from all vestige of tradition, and so the heart of man might be bathed by an inundation of eternal love, conversing with that which he knows was always and always must be, because it really is now. I appeared, moreover, that if this doctrine could be stated in terms with any resemblance to those bright intuitions, in, in which this truth is sometimes revealed to us, it would be a star in many dark hours and crooked passages, crooked passages in our journey that would not suffer us to lose our way. I was lately confirmed in these desires by hearing a sermon of con uh, a church. The preacher, a man esteemed for his orthodoxy, unfolded in the ordinary manner the doctrine of the last judgment. He assumed that judgment is not executed in this world, and the wicked are successful and the good are miserable, and then urged one reason from Scripture, a compensation to be made to both parties in the next life. No offense appeared to be taken by the congregation at this doctrine. As far as I could observe, when the meeting broke up, they separated without remark on the sermon. Yet, what was the import of this teaching? What did the preacher mean by saying that the good are miserable in the present life? Was it that houses and lands, offices, wine, horses, dress, luxury are had by unprincipled men, while the saints are poor and despised, and that a compensation is to be made to these in their to these last hereafter by giving them the like gratifications another day, bank stock and doubloons, venison and champagne? This must be the compensation intended for. What else? It is that they are to have leave to pray and praise, to love and serve men. Why that they can do now? The legitimate inferences the disciple would draw was, we are to have such a good time as sinners have now, or to push it to its extreme import, you sin now, we shall sin by and by. We would sin now, if we could, not being successful, we expect our revenge tomorrow. The fallacy lay in the immense concession that the bad are successful, that justice is not done now. The blindness of the preacher consists in deferring to the base estimate of the market of what constitutes a manly success, instead of confronting and convicting the world from the truth. Announcing the presence of the soul, the omnipresence of the will, and so establishing the standard of good and ill, of success and falsehood, and summoning the dead to its present tribunal. I find a similar base tone in the popular religious works of the day, and the same doctrines assumed by literary men when occasionally they treat the related topics. I think that our popular theology has gained in decorum and not in principle over the superstitions it has displaced. 
but men are better than this theology. Their daily life gives it the lie. Every ingenious and inspiring soul leaves the doctrine behind him in his own experience, and all men feel sometimes the falsehood which they cannot demonstrate. For men are wiser than they know. What that which they hear in schools and pulpits without afterthought, if said in conversation, would probably be questioned in silence. If a man dogmatized in a mixed company on providence and the divine laws, he is answered by a silence that conveys well enough to an observer the dissatisfaction of the hearer, but his incapacity to make his own statement. I shall attempt in this and the following chapter to record some facts that indicate the path of the law of compensation, happy beyond my expectation if I shall truly draw the smallest arc of this circle. Polarity or action and reaction. We meet in every part of nature, in darkness and light, in heat and cold, in the ebb and flow of waters, in male and female, in the inspiration and expiration of plants and animals, in the systole and diastole of the heart, in the undulations of fluid and of sound, in the centrifugal and centripetal gravity, in electricity, galvanism, and chemical affinity. Superinduce magnetism at one end of a needle, the opposite magnetism takes place at the other end. If the south attracts, the north repels. To empty here you must condense there. An inevitable dualism by sex nature so that each thing is a half and suggests another thing to make it a whole. As spirit, matter, man, woman, subject, objective, in, subjective, objective, in, out, umpert, under, motion, rest, yea and nay. While the world is thus dual, so is every one of its parts. The entire system of things gets represented in every particle. There is something that resembles the ebb and flow of the sea, day and night, man and woman, in a single needle of the pine, in a kernel of corn, in each individual of every animal tribe. The reaction to grand, so grand in the elements is repeated within these small boundaries. For example, in the animal kingdom, the physiologist has observed that no greater, no creature, no creatures are favorites, but a certain compensation balances every gift and every defect. A surplusage gives to one part is paid out of a reduction from another part of the same character or same creature. If the head and neck are enlarged, the trunk and extremities are cut short. The theory of the mechanic forces is another example. What we gain in power is lost in time and the converse. The periodic or compensating errors of the planets is another instance. The influences of, na of climate and soil in political history are another. The cold invigorates. The barren soil does not breed fevers, crocodiles, tigers, or scorpions. The same dualism underlies the nature and the conditions of man. Every excess causes a defect every defect and excess. Every sweet hath its sour, and every evil its good. Every faculty which is a receiver of pleasure has an equal penalty put on its abuse. It is to answer for its moderation with its life. For every grain of wit there is a grain of folly. For everything you have missed you have gained something else, and for everything you gain, you lose something. If riches increase, they are increased that use them. If the gatherer gathers too much, nature takes out of the man what he puts into his chest, swells the estate, but kills the owner. Nature hates monopolies and exceptions. The waves of the sea do not, do not more speedily seek a level from their loftiest tossing, then the varieties of conditions tend to equalize themselves. There is always some leveling circumstance that puts down the overbearing, the strong, the rich, the fortunate, substantially on the same grounds with all others. It is a man too strong, is a man too strong and fierce for society, and by temper and position a bad citizen, a morose ruffian, with a dash of the pirate in him. Nature sends him a troop of pretty sons and daughters who are getting along in the dame's class at the village school and love and fear 
for them, soothes, smooths his grim scowl to courtesy. Thus she contrives to, inter to interrate the granite and felspar, takes the boar out and puts the lamb in and keeps her balance true. The farmer imagines power in place of fine things, but the president has paid dear for his white house. It has commonly cost him all of his peace and the best of his manly attributes to preserve for a short time so conspicuous an appearance before the world. He is content to eat dust before the real masters who stand erect behind the throne. Or do men desire the more substantial and permanent grandeur of genius? Neither has this an immunity. He who, will, who by force of will or thought is great and overlooks thousands has the responsibility of overlooking. With every influx of light comes new danger. H has he light? He must bear witness to the light and always outrun the sympathy which gives him such keen satisfaction by his fidelity to new revelations of the incessant soul. He must hate father and mother, wife and child. Has he all that the world loves and admires and covets? He must cast behind him their admiration and afflict them by faithfulness to his truth and become a byword and a hissing. This law writes the laws of cities and nations. It will not be balked of its end in the smallest iota. It is in vain to build or plot or combine against it. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. Though no checks to a new evil appear, the checks exist and will appear. If a government is cruel, the governor's life is not safe. If you tax too high, the revenue will yield nothing. If you make the criminal code, code sanguinary, juries will not convict. Nothing arbitrary, nothing artificial can endure. The true life and satisfactions of man seem to elude the most rigors of felicities of condition and to establish themselves with great indifferency under all varieties of circumstance. Under all governments, the influence of character remains the same in Turkey and in New England about alike. Under the primeval despots of Egypt, history honestly confesses that man must have been as free as culture could make him. These appearances indicate the fact that the universe is represented in every one of its particles. Everything in nature contains all the powers of nature. Everything is made of one hidden stuff. As the naturalist sees one type under every metamorphosis and regards a horse as a running man, a fish as a swimming man, a bird as a flying man, a tree as a rooted man, each new form repeats not only the main character of the type, but part for part all the details, all the aims, furtherances, hindrances, energies, and whole systems of every order other. Every occupation, trade, art, or transaction is a compend of the world and the core relative and the core relative of every other. Each one is an entire emblem of human life. Of its good and ill, its trials, its enemies, its course and its end. And each one must somehow accommodate the whole man and recite all his destiny. The world globe itself is a drop of dew. The microscope cannot find the animalcule that is less perfect for being little. Eyes, ears, taste, smell, motion, resistance, appetite, and organs of reproduction that take hold on eternity all find room to consist in the small creature. So do we put our life in the so do we put our life into every act. The true doctrine of omnipresence is that God reappears with all his parts in every moss and cobweb. The value of the universe contrives to, th to throw itself into every point. If the good is there, so is the evil. If the affinity, so the repulsion. If the force, so the limitation. Thus is the universe alive. All things are moral. That soul which within us is a sentiment, outside of us is a law. We feel its inspiration out there in, the, in history. We can see its fatal strength. 
It is almighty. All nature feels its grasp. It is the world, and the world was made by it. It is eternal, but it enacts itself in time and space. Justice is not position, postponed. A perfect equity adjusts its balance in all parts of life. The dice of God are always loaded. The world looks like a multiplication table or a mathematical equation, which, turn it how you will, balances itself. Take that figure you will, its exact value, no more and no less, still returns to you. Every secret is told, every crime is punished, every virtue is rewarded, every wrong redressed, in silence and certainty. What we call retribution is the universal necessity by which the whole appears wherever a part appears. If you see smoke, there must be fire. If you see a hand or a limb, you know that the trunk to which it belongs is there behind. Every act rewards itself, or in other words, integrates itself in a twofold manner. First in the thing, or in real nature, and secondly in the circumstance, or in apparent nature. Men call the circumstance the retribution. The causal retribution is in the thing, and is seen by the soul. The retribution in the circumstance is seen by the understanding. It is inseparable from the thing, but is often spread over a long time, and so does not become distinct until after many years. The specific stripes may follow late after the offense, but they follow because they accompany it. Crime and punishment grow out of one stem. Punishment is a fruit and unsuspected ripens within the flower of the pleasure which concealed it. Cause and effect means and ends, seed and fruit, cannot be severed for the effect already blooms in the cause. The end pre-exists in the means, and the fruit in the seed. While thus the world will be whole, and refuses to be disparted, we seek to act partially, to sunder, to appropriate, to, for example, to gratify the senses, we sever the pleasure of the senses from the needs of the character. The ingenuity of man has been dedicated also always to the solution of one problem. How did he attach the sensual sweet, the sensual strong, and the sensual bright, etc., from the sensual sweet, the, the moral deep, the moral fair, that is, again, to contrive to cut clean off this upper surface, so thin as to leave it bottomless, to get a one end without other end. The soul says, eat, the body would feast. The soul says, the man and woman shall be one flesh and one soul. The body would join the flesh only. The soul says, have dominion over all things to the end of virtue. The body would have the power over things to its own ends. The soul strives amain to live and work through all things. It would be the only fact. All things shall be added unto it, power, pleasure, knowledge, and beauty. The particular man aims to be somebody, to set up for himself, to truck and higgle for a private good, and in particulars to ride, that he may ride, to dress, that he may be dressed, to eat, that he may seek to be great. Men seek to be great. They would have offices, wealth, power, and fame. They think that to be great is to get only one side of nature, the sweet, without the other side, the bitter. Steadily is this dividing and detaching con counteracted. Up to this day it must be owned no projector has had the smallest success. The parted water reunites behind our hand. Pleasure is taken out of pleasant things, and profit out of profitable things, power out of strong things. The moment we seek to separate them from the whole, we can no more have th have things and get the sensual good by itself than we can get an inside that shall have no outside, or a light without a shadow. Drive out nature with a fork, and she keep, and she comes running back. Life invests with in inevitable conditions which the unwise seek to dodge, which one and another brags that he does not know, brags that they do not touch him, but 
the brag is on his lips the conditions are in his soul if he escapes them in one part they attack him in another more vital part if he has escaped them in form and in the appearance it is that he has resisted his life and fled from himself and the retribution is so much death so signal is the failure of all attempts to make this separation of the good from the tax that the experiment would not be tried since to try is to be mad but to be but to the circus but for the circumstance and when the disease began in the will of rebellion and separation the intellect is at once infected so that the man ceases to see God whole in each object but is able to see the sensual allurement of an object and not see the sensual hurt he sees the mermaid's head but not the dragon's tail and thinks he can cut off that which he would which he would have from that which he would not have how secret art thou who dwellest in the highest heavens in silence O thou only great God sprinkling with all unwearied providence certain penal blindnesses upon such as have unbridled desires the human soul is true to these facts in the painting of a fable of history of law of proverb of conversation it finds a tongue and literature unaware thus the Greeks called Jupiter supreme mind but having traditionally ascribed to him many base actions they involuntarily made amends to reason by trying by tying up the hands of so bad a god he is made as helpless as a king of England Prometheus knows, knows knows one secret, but Jove must bargain for. Minerva another. He cannot get his own thunders. Minerva keeps the key of them. Of all the gods I know, I only know the keys that ope the doors, solid doors within those whose vaults his thunders keep. A plain confession of the inworking of the all and of its moral aim the Indian mythology ends in the same ethics and indeed it would seem impossible for any fable to be invented and get any currency which was not moral Aurora forgot to ask youth for her lover and so through Tithonius is immortal he is old Achilles is not quite invulnerable for Thetis held him f by his heel when he dipped him when she dipped him in the sticks and the sacred waters did not wash the part Siegfried in the Nibelungen is not quite immortal for a leaf fell on his back while he was bathing in the dragon's blood and that spot which covered which it covered is immortal and so it always is there is a crack in everything God has made always it would seem there is this vindictive circumstance stealing in at unawares even into the wild posy in which the human fancy attempted to make bold holiday and to shake itself free of the old laws this backstroke this kick of the gun certifying that the law is fatal that in nature nothing can be given and all things are sold I'd like to continue this um, essay next week. I'll stop here at this point. I want to thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed this portion of the show. Um, and I think you'll enjoy the second part of this essay. Um, I thank you very much for watching, and I hope you'll see me again next week. Good night. It was written over about 150 years ago. And this is the second half of it. Um, here we go. That is the ancient had an occult sympathy with the wrongs of their owners. That the belt which Ajax gave Hector dragged the Trojan hero over the field of the wheels of the car of Achilles. And the sword which Hector gave Ajax was that on whose point Ajax fell. They recorded that then the, Th the Thasians erected a statue to Theogenes, a victor in the games. One of his rivals went 
to it by night and endeavored to throw it down by repeated blows until at last he moved it from its pedestal and was crushed to death beneath its fall. The voice of fable has in it somewhat divine. It came from thought above the will of the writer. That is the best part of each writer, which is nothing private in him. That is the best part of each, which is which he does not know. That which flowed out of his cons constitution, and not from his too active invention. That which is that which is the study of a single artist you might not easily find, but in the study of many, you would abstract, as the spirit of them all. Phidias. It is not but the work of man in that early Hellenic world that I would know. The name and circumstances of Phidias, however, convenient for history, embarrasses when we come to the highest criticism. We are to see that which man was tending to do in a given period, and was hindered, or if you will, modified in doing, by the intervening violations of Phidias, of Dante, of Shakespeare, the organ whereby man at the moment wrought. Still more striking is the expression of this fact in the Proverbs of all nations, which are always the literature of reason, or the statements of an absolute truth without qualification. Proverbs, like the sacred books of each nation, are the, are the sanctuary of the institutions, or the intuitions, rather, I'm sorry. That which the drowning world chained to appearances will not allow the realist to say that in his own words. It will suffer him to say in Proverbs without contra contradiction. And this law of laws which the pulpit, the senate, and the college deny is hourly preached in all markets and all languages by flights of Proverbs, whose, teachings, whose teaching is as true and as omnipresent as that of birds and flies. All things are double, one against another, tit for tat, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood, measure for measure, love for love. Give it shall be given, give and it shall be given to you. He that watereth shall be watered himself. What will ye have, quoth God? Pay for it and take it, nothing venture, nothing have. You shall be paid exactly for what thou hast done, no more and no less. Who doth not work shall not eat. Harm watch, harm catch. Curse always recoil on the head of him who imper imprecates it. If you put a chain around the neck of a slave, the other end fastens itself around your own. Bad counsel confounds the adviser. The devil is an ass. It is thus written because it is thus in life. Our action is overmastered and characterized above our will by the law of nature, the aim of a petty end quite aside from the public good, but our act arranges itself by irresistible magnetism in a line which the poles of the world. A man cannot speak, but he judges himself. With his will, or against his will, he draws his portrait to the eye of his companion in every word, every opinion reacts on him who utters it. It is a thread ball thrown at a mark, but the other end remains in the thrower's bag. Or rather, it's a harpoon thrown at the whale, unwinding, as it flies a coil of cord in the boat, and if the harpoon is not good or not well thrown, it will go nigh to cut the steerman in twain or to sink the boat. You cannot do wrong without suffering wrong. No man can ever point, no man had ever a point of pride that was not injurious to him, said Burke. The exclusive, the exclusive, infashionable life does not see that he excludes himself from enjoyment. In the attempt to appropriate it, the exclusionist in religion does not see that he shuts the door of heaven on himself in striving to shut others out. Treat man as pawns and ninepins, and you shall suffer as they. If you leave out their heart, you shall lose your own. The senses would make things of all persons, of women, of children, of the poor. The vulgar proverb, I will get it from his purse, or get it from his skin, is sound philosophy. All infractions of love and equity in our social relations are speedily punished. They are punished by fear. 
While I stand in simple relations to my fellow man, I have no displeasure in meeting him. We meet as waters meet water, or a current of air meets another. With perfect diffusion and interpenetration of nature. But as soon as there is an, any departure from simplicity, an attempt at halfness, or good for me, that is not good for him, my neighbor feels the wrong. He shrinks from me as far as I have shrunk from him. His eyes no longer seek mine. There is war between us. There is hate in him and fear in me. All these old abuses in society, the great and universal and the petty and particular, all unjust accumulations of property and power, are avenged in the same manner. Fear is an instructor of great sagacity, and the herald of all revolutions. One thing he always teaches, that there is rottenness where he appears. He is a Karen crow, and, a, and, a, and, through, and though you see not well what he hovers for, there is death somewhere. Our property is timid, our laws are timid, our cultivated classes are timid. Fear for ages are bodied and mowed and gibbed over our government and property. That obscene bird is not there for nothing. He indicates great wrong which must be revised. Of the like nature is that expectation of change which instantly follows the suspension of our voluntary activity. The terror of the cloudless noon, the emerald of Polycrates, the, the awe of prosperity, the instinct which leads each generous soul to impose on itself tasks of a noble aestheticism and vicarious virtue are the tremblings of the balance of justice through the heart and mind of a man. Experienced men of the world know very well that it is always best to pay Scott and Lot as they go along, and that a man often pays dear for a small frugality. The borrower runs in his own debt. Has a man gained anything who has received a hundred favors and rendered none? Has he gained any borrowing, though indolence or cunning? Through indolence or cunning, his neighbor's wares or horses or money. There arises on the deed the instant acknowledgment of benefit on the other part, on one part, and of debt on the other, that is, of superiority and inferiority. The transaction remains in the memory of himself and his neighbor, and every new transaction alters according to its nature, their relation to each other. He may soon come to see that he had better have broken his own bones than to have ridden in his neighbor's coach and that the highest price he can pay for a thing is to ask for it. A wise man will extend his lesson to all parts of life, and know that it is always the part of prudence to face every claimant, and pay every just demand on your time, your talent, or your heart. Always pay, for first or last you must pay your entire debt. Persons and events may stand for a time between you and justice, but it's only a postponement. You must pay at last your own debt. If you are wise, you will dread a posterity which only loads you with more. Benefit is the end of nature, but for every benefit which you receive, a tax is levied. This is great who confers the most benefits. He is great who confers the most benefits. He is base, and that is the one base thing in the universe, to receive favors and render none. In the order of nature, we cannot render benefits to those from whom we receive them or only sell them. But the benefit we receive must be re rendered again, line for line, deed for deed, cent for cent to somebody. Beware of too much good staying in your hand. It will fast up and worm worms. Pay it away quickly in some sort. Labor is watched over by the same pitiless laws. Cheapest, say the prudent, is the dearest labor. What we buy in a broom, a mat, a wagon, a knife, in some application of good sense to a common want, it is best to pay in your land a skillful gardener, or to buy good sense applied to gardening in your, in your sailor, good sense applied to navigation. In the house, good sense applied 
to cooking, sewing, serving, and your agent, good sense applied to accounts and affairs. So do, do you multiply your so do you multiply your presence or spread yourself throughout your estate? But because of the dual constitution of things, in labor as in life, there can be no cheating. The thief steals from himself, the swindler swindles himself, for the real price of labor is knowledge and virtue, whereof wealth and credits are signs. These signs, like paper money, may be counterfeited or stolen, but that which they represent, namely knowledge and virtue, cannot be counterfeited or stolen. These ends of labor cannot be answered by any real exertions of the mind and in obedience to pure motives. The cheat, the defaulter, the gambler cannot extort their benefit, cannot extort the knowledge of material and moral nature which his honest care and pains yield to the operative. The law of nature is, do the thing and you shall have the power, but they who do not the thing have not the power. Human labor through all its forms, from the sharpening of a stake to the construction of a city or an epic, is one immense illustration of the perfect compensation of the universe. Everywhere and always this law is sublime. The absolute balance of give and take, the doctrine that everything has its price, and if this, that price is not paid, not that thing but something else is obtained, and that is impossible to get anything without its price. This doctrine is not less sublime in the columns of a ledger than in the budgets of state, in the laws of light and darkness, and all the actions and reactions of nature. I cannot doubt that the high laws which each man sees ever implicated in those processes with which he is conversant, the stern ethic which sparkle on his chisel edge, which are measured out by his plumb and foot rule, and which stands as manifest in the footing of the shop bill as the history of a state do re recommend to him his trade, and through and though seldom named, exalt his business to his imagination. The league between virtue and nature engages all things to assume a hostile front to vice. The beautiful laws and substances of the world persecute and whip the traitor. He finds that things are arranged for truth and benefit, but there is no den in the wide world to hide a rogue. There is no such thing as concealment. Crime, commit a crime, and the earth is made of glass. Commit a crime, and the earth is made of... And the earth... Commit a crime, and it seems as if a coat of snow fell on the ground, such as reveals in the, wood, in the woods the tracks of every partridge and fox and squirrel and mole. You cannot recall the spoken word, you cannot wipe out the foot track, you cannot draw up the ladder, so as to leave no inlet or, ch or clue. Always some damning circumstance transpires. The laws and substances of nature, water, snow, wind, gravitation, become penalties to the thief. On the other hand, the law holds with equal uh, sure, uh, sureness for all right action. Love, and you shall be loved. All love is mathematically just, as much as the two sides of an algebraic equation. The good man has absolute good, which, like the fire, turns everything to its own nature, so that you cannot do him any harm. But as the royal army sent against Napoleon, when he approached, cast down their colors, and from enemies became friends, so do disasters of all kinds, as sickness, offense, poverty, prove benefactors. Winds blow and waters roll, strength to the brave and power and deity, yet in themselves are nothing. The good are befriended, even by weakness and defect. As no man had ever a point of pride that was not injurious to him, so no man had ever a defect that was not somewhere made useful to him. The stag in the fable admired his horns and blamed his feet, but when the hunter came, his feet saved him, and afterward, caught in the thicket, his horns destroyed him. Every man in his lifetime needs to thank his faults. As no man thoroughly understands a truth, until first he is contented, and, uh, until first he... Let me read that again. As no man thoroughly understands a truth, until first he has contended against it. 
so no man has a thorough acquaintance with the hindrance or talents of men until he has suffered from the one and seen the triumph of the other over his own want of the same. Has he a defect of temper that unfits him to live in society? Thereby he is driven to entertain himself alone and acquires habits of self-help, and thus, like the wounded oyster, he mends his shell with a pearl. Or the strength grows out of our weakness, not until not until we, we are pricked and stung and sorely shot at, awakens the indignation which arms itself in secret forces. A great man is always willing to be little. While he sits on the cushion of advantages, he goes to sleep. When he is pushed, tormented, defeated, he has a chance to learn something. He has been put on his wits, on his manhood. He has gained facts, learned his ignorance, is cured of this insanity of conceit, has got moderation and real skill. The wise man always throws himself on the side of his assailants. It is more his interest than it is theirs to find his weak point. The wound citizizes and falls off from him like a dead skin, and when they would triumph, lo, he has passed on and vulnerable. Blame is safer than praise. I hate to be defended in a newspaper. As long as all that is said is said against me, I feel a certain assurance of success. But as soon as honeyed words of praise are spoken for me, I feel as one that lies unprotected before his enemies. In general, every evil to which we do not succumb is a benefactor. As the Sandwich Islander believes that the strength and valor of the enemy he kills passes into himself, so we gain the strength of the temptation we resist. The same guards which protect us from disaster, defect, and enmity defend us, if we will, for selfishness and fraud. Bolts and bars are not the best of our institutions, nor is shrewdness in trade a mark of wisdom. Men suffer all their life long under the foolish superstition that they can be cheated by any one but themselves as f they but it is as impossible for a man to be cheated by any one but himself as for a thing to be and not to be at the same time. There is a third silent party to all bargains. The nature and soul of things takes on itself the guarantee of the fulfillment of every contract, so that honest service cannot come to loss. If you serve an ungrateful master, serve him the more. Put God in your debt. Every stroke shall be repaid. The longer the payment is withheld, the better, you, the better for you. For compound interest on compound interest is the rate and usage of this exchequer. The history of persecution is a history of endeavors to cheat nature, to make waters run uphill, to twist a rope of sand, to make no difference whether the actors be many or one, a tyrant or a mob. A mob is a society of bodies voluntarily bereaving themselves of reasons and traversing their wor its work. The mob is a voluntary descending to the nature of the beast. Its fit hour of activity is night. Its actions are insane, like its whole constitution. It persecutes a principle. It would whip a right. It would tar and feather justice by inflicting fire and outrage upon the houses and persons of those who have these. In resemble, it resembles the pranks of boys who run with fire engines to put out the ruddy aurora streaming to the, steaming to the stars. The inviolate spirit turns their spite against the wrongdoers. The martyr cannot be dishonored. Every lash inflicted is a tongue of fame. Every prison a more illustrious abode. Every burned book or house enlightened the world enlightens the world. Every suppressed or expunged word reverberates through the earth from side to side. The minds of men are at last aroused. Reason looks out and justifies her own, and malice finds all her work vain. It is the whipper who is whipped, and the tyrant who is undone. Thus do, I, thus do all things preach the indifferency of circumstances. The man is all. Everything has two sides, a good and an evil. Every advantage has its tax. 
I learn to be content. But the doctrine of compensation is not the doctrine of indifferency. The thoughtlessness say, the thoughtless say, on hearing these representations, what boots it to do well? There is one event too good and evil. If I gain any good, I must pay for it. If I lose any good, I gain some other. All actions are indifferent. There is a deeper fact in the soul that compensation to it its own nature. The soul is not a compensation but a life. The soul is under all this running sea of circumstance whose waters ebb and flow with perfect balance lies the original abyss of being real. Existence of God is not a relation or a part but the whole. Being is the, fur is the vast affirmative, excluding negation, self-balanced and swallowing up all relations, parts and times within itself. Nature's true, nature, true virtue are the influx from thence. Vice is the absence or departure of the same. Nothing falsehood, nothing. Falsehood may indeed stand as the great night or shade on which, as a background, the living universe paints itself forth. But no fact is begotten by it. It cannot work, for it is not. It cannot work any good. It cannot work any harm. It is harm inasmuch it is, as it is worse not to be than to be. We feel defrauded of the retribution due to evil acts because the criminal adheres to his vice and, and contumacy and does not come to a crisis or judgment anywhere in visible nature. There is no stunning confutation of this nonsense before men and angels. Has he therefore outwitted the law? Inasmuch as he carried the malignity and the lie with him, he so far deceases from nature. In some manner there will be a demonstration of the wrong to the understanding also. But should we not see it, this deadly deduction makes square the eternal account. Neither can it be said, on the other hand, that the gain of rectitude must be bought by any loss. There is no penalty for vir to virtue, no penalty to wisdom. They are proper additions of being. In a virtuous action I am properly am. In a virtuous act I add to the world. I, pla I plant into deserts conquered from chaos and nothing, and see the darkness receding on the limits of the horizon. There can be no excess to love, none to knowledge, none to beauty, when these attributes are considered in the purest sense. The soul refuses all limits. It affirms in man always an optimism and never a pessimism. His life is a progress and not a station. His instinct is trust. Our instinct uses more and less in application to man always of the presence of the soul and not of its absence. The brave man is greater than the coward. The true, the benevolent, the wise is more a man and not less than the fool and knave. There is, therefore, no tax on the good of virtue, for that is the incoming of God himself or absolute existence without any comparative all external good has its tax, and if it came without des desert or sweat, has no root in me, and the next wind will blow it away. But all the good of nature is the soul's and may be had, if paid for in nature's lawful coin, that is, by labor which the heart and the head allow. I no longer wish to meet a good I do not earn. For example, to find a pot of buried gold, knowing that it brings with it new responsibility. I do not wish more external goods, neither possessions, nor honors, nor power, nor persons. The gain is apparent, the tax is certain. But there is no tax on the knowledge, and the compensation exists, and that is, and that it is not desirable to dig up treasure. Herein I rejoice with a serene eternal peace. I contract, I contract the boundaries of a possible mischief. I learn the wisdom of St. Bernard. Nothing can work me damage except myself. 
The harm that I sustain I carry about with me, and never am I a real sufferer, but by my own fault. In the nature of the soul is the compensation for the inequalities of condition. The radical tra tragedy of nature seems to be the distinction of more and less. Now, how can less not feel the pain? How not feel indignation or malevolence toward more? Look at those who have less faculty, and one feels sad, and knows not well what to make of it. Almost he shuns their eye, almost he fears they will upbraid God. What should they do? It seems a great injustice, but face the facts and see them near, nearly, and these mountainous inequalities vanish. Love reduces them all, as a sun melts the iceberg in the sea, the heart and soul of all men being one. This bitterness of his and mine ceases. His is mine. I am my brother, and my brother is me. If I feel overshadowed and outdone by, by great neighbors, I can yet love, I can still receive, and yet that loveth maketh his own the grander he loves. Thereby I make the discovery that my brother is my guardian, and acting for me in the friendliest designs, and the estate I so admired and envied is my own. It is the eternal nature of the soul, the appropriate, and make it the appropriate to the. It is the eternal nature of the soul to appropriate and make all things its own. Jesus and Shakespeare are fragments of the soul, and by love I conquer and incorporate them in my own conscious domain. His virtue is not that mine. His wit, if it cannot be made mine, it is not wit. Such also is the natural history of calamity, the changes that break up at short intervals, the prosperity of men, the adver advertisements of a nature whose law is growth. Evermore it is the order of nature to grow, and every soul is by this intrinsic necessity quitting this whole system of things, its friends and homes and laws and faith, and the shellfish crawls out of its beautiful but stony case because it no longer admits of its growth and slowly forms a new house. In proportion to the vigor of the individual, these revolutions are frequent, but in some happier mind they are incessant, and all worldly relations hang very loosely around them. Cut here for a second. And, so, and slowly forms a new house. In proportion to the vigor of the individual, these revolutions are frequent until in some happier mind they are incessant and all worldly relations hang very loosely about them, becoming, as it were, a transparent fluid membrane through which the form is always seen and not as in most men an indurated heterogeneous fabric of many dates and of no settled character in which the man is imprisoned. Then there can be enlargement and the man of today scarcely recognizes the man of yesterday. And such should be the outward biography of man in time, a putting off of dead circumstances day by day as he renews his raiments day by day. But to us in our lapsed estate, resting not advancing, resisting not cooperating with the divine expansion, this growth comes by shocks. We cannot part with our friends. We cannot let our angels go. We do not see that they only go out and archangels come in. They are idolaters of the old. We do not believe the riches of the soul in its proper eternity and omnipresence. We do not believe there is any force in today to rival or recreate the beautiful yesterday. We linger in the ruins of the old tent where once we had bread and shelter and organs. Now believe that the spirit can feed, cover, and nerve us again. We cannot g again find aught so dear, so sweet, so graceful, but we sit and weep in vain. The voice of the Almighty saith, Up and onward forevermore. We cannot stay amid the ruins, neither will we rely on the new, and so we walk ever with reverted eyes like those monsters who look backwards. 
and yet the compensations of calamity are made apparent to the understanding also that long intervals of time a fever a mutilation a cruel disappointment a loss of wealth a loss of friends seems at the moment unpaid loss and unpayable but the sure years reveal the deep remedial force that underlies all facts the death of a dear friend wife brother lover which seemed nothing but privation somewhat later assumes the aspects of aspect of a guide or genius for it commonly operates revolutions in our way of life terminates an epoch of infancy or of youth which was wanting or which was waiting to be closed breaks up a wanted occupation or a household or style of living and allows the formation of new ones more friendly to the growth of character it permits or constrains the formation of, of new acquaintances and the reception of new influences that prove of the first importance to the next year and the man or woman who would have remained a sunny garden flower with no room for its roots and too much sunshine for its head by the falling of the walls and the neglect of the gardener is made the banyan of the forest yielding the shade and fruit to wide neighborhoods of men that's the end of that um, essay and uh, I hope you enjoyed it I hope you got something out of it um, I wish I could have done it all to try to attempt to explain some of this maybe it's not needed but I feel in some cases it may be uh, some areas of the essay may need to be enlightened um, uh, a bit the law of compensation with, with uh, Emerson's compensation it transforms itself into a global and a, a universal concept that regulates all of natural activity, all nature, all everything. And it's such a formidable concept uh, based in deep religious theory but um, formulated from this writer from New England, uh, this theologian, this preacher, um, and, 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 and I believe that to me it, it reaches me, it, 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 and I hope it reaches you in that same way. The next essay that I wanted to read, and I am re a bit reluctant to because of time factor and, and, and interest, and I don't want to lose my audience from these long and lengthy um, readings but they're so important um, they're, 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 they, they're so they seem so important to me and um, I would think they would be important to anyone who reads them um, th I was hoping to to do the next one I, I may not but the next essay that he wrote uh, or the next one that I wanted to read was called The Oversoul I mentioned it briefly in my introduction in my last show, um, and um, what the Oversoul basically is, is the, is God, it's God's law, God's uh, greatness, uh, the balance of nature, the, the, that, that integral part of man's makeup that 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 keeps him attuned to life. Um, in the laws of compensation, you have a tit for tat. You have a weight, a scale. But in the Oversoul, you have you have a great being or a great consciousness that 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 is integrated in every activity of man and keeps him from. Um, from going mad, basically, and keeps the world from exploding, and keeps us from keeps us alive. Uh, the Oversoul regulates our bodies, our minds, uh, 
regulates civilization, regulates religion, regulates all of us, all of everything. And I don't think I can, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how um, overwhelming a concept that is. Um, yes, we believe that. Uh, some people believe in God, other people believe in nothing, and other people believe in something else. But regardless of what their belief is, what Emerson says in a very secular way, because he was a Protestant preacher, and a New England pragmatist, and a, and, and, and a philosopher, and a theologian, and a um, very wise and educated man. And what he believed, and what he wrote, was that no man can assume that he's greater than, than the world, or that he's greater than the laws which govern the universe. And the laws which govern the universe are essentially coined in his phrase, or in his, are, are, are in the oversoul. Um, I hesitate to inflict upon you my views, uh, my religious views or otherwise, but I, 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 I really feel that uh, in this case Emerson has inspired me over the years as so many others have men have and women but um, I believe that in your own readings that if you could pick up a copy of the of Emerson's essays um, and look through them and read them and I guarantee you that a number of them will inspire you and it will become your constant companion as it has for me over the years and I can tell you that I've I've read these essays numbers of times I, I countless times over and over again and each time they bring something new to me and they bring some new understanding um, possibly and you know it's up to the individual and what you're open to but I hope that you get something out of these courses, out of the, out of this course, yeah, out out of this, cla um, out of these lectures, and out of these readings, and I hope that we can somehow converge into a grandiose um, uh, commitment to higher education or higher thought, um, and if I can do any of that. Uh, with this program, then uh, I've succeeded far, far beyond my expectations.